Houston Dynamo, Portland Timbers, Sporting Kansas, Los Angeles Galaxy, Beach Pass, Toronto FC, Salt Lake, Chicago Fire, Columbus Crew, FC Dallas, New York Red Bulls, Pitch Pass, your all-access credential to the people that matter in MLS. Here's your host, Greg Roach. Welcome to Pitch Pass. Whew, what a day as we record this on Tuesday evening. Big announcement. Shook up not just the world of American soccer, but also global soccer, which is always a great thing for MLS snobs like myself. I love when the league is front and center, top of mind in the world. And today, MLS is close, if not at the top of the soccer world's mindset. We'll talk to Dominic Odoro of Columbus Crew later on in the show. Maybe uh, one of the hottest goal scorers in the league, him, maybe a couple other people. We'll talk to him a little bit later. But first, we get everything about New York City FC. We do some speculation. We do some thoughts. We get into it all with NBC Sports Network analyst Kyle Martino. Kyle, how are you, my friend? I'm good, man. You know, um, we don't have much to talk about today, do we? Uh, no, no news going on. I think it was such a boring show. Now, did you, with your, all your insider connections, did you have any idea that today was the day was gonna, everything was going to drop? Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be that in the now. No, I will not do you that disservice. How big of a surprise was it for you that the Yankees were ended up being involved? Yeah, I think that out of everything, that's really the only surprise. You know, everyone had a, had a beat on... Uh, you know, New York City, everyone sort of had a beat on Manchester City, Sheikh Mansour. I think all of that, I mean, for the last, uh, easily since 2012, has been pretty apparent to people that that was the next move, that Don Garber was behind it, that MLS really wanted it to happen. I think the uh, the surprise was definitely the last-minute inclusion of, you know, the historical uh, sports franchise, the New York Yankees, and to add that little bit of metropolitan credibility and American sports credibility, I think uh, was the, the jaw-dropping moment for a lot of people. I got to be honest, uh, you know, as a, as a neutral to the, the, the New York situation, uh, I'm a D.C. United fan, but I, I try to approach it as an MLS fan. As a D.C. United fan, it really doesn't, it's not a surprise and it's not something that I look at as a negative thing, but a lot of my, the way that I'm looking at this is all from a, a New York Red Bull point of view. And, I, I, you know, would you want to get into that now or do you want to talk about maybe the, the, the league-wide impact of a, of a New York franchise? Well, yeah, yeah, let's touch let's touch on that because you know I think immediately in the Twitter sphere and social media the, the 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 critics come out and it's always the sort of negative aspect that gets touched on first and the first complaint is is obviously that um, you know any time there has ever been another New York franchise in in American sports history it's been because of the demand for that franchise you know the, the, because the first club has been doing so well and there's a need to add an additional club uh and uh you know play on the sort of sports rivalries and all of that and the york red bulls you know a lot of those fans are a little bit upset because they feel like look you know we haven't we built this beautiful stadium we haven't been able to fill it yet the demand isn't there for another sports franchise so does this dilute an already struggling uh uh fan base that that now we're splitting fans that aren't even filling one stadium. And, and I understand that sentiment. I just don't think it's valid. I, I don't think this move is one to, to uh, split to uh, a, a fan group into two sections. And now you have to pick uh, Red Bulls or New York City FC. You know, this isn't two parents splitting and asking, you know, the kids which one they want to live with. This is activating a huge group of fans, huge group of soccer fans in one of the most, if not the most diverse areas of the entire world and asking them to engage, trying to activate a soccer fan base that hasn't yet gotten engaged in the New York Red Bulls. And I think two things happen here. One is you, you activate all of these fans and hopefully get growth in, in a very crucial market in the United States. And also, I think it can be argued that that helps the New York Red Bulls. That gets some on-the-fence New York Red Bulls fans to step up and say, now more than ever, we need to support our club because we got someone in our backyard. And is it a risk? You know, is it a, a bet MLS is making? Of course. You know, there's no way to know if this is going to pan out. 
but I think it's a calculated risk that needed to happen. Well, the next couple of questions I have are all predicated on whether you believe or don't believe Don Garber in his, his statement today saying that, well, that Red Bulls all along have known that the goal of the, the league was to get a second club in New York City. Now, if you believe Don Garber when you say when he says that, I guess the next couple of things don't really matter. But if you if you don't believe or you, you treat that with a little bit of skepticism and you are Red Bull the corporation, don't you go, wait a second, you know, we were the first call that was answered when we got through the commissioner. Maybe LA Galaxy uh, is ahead of us. This puts us firmly as the third call answered if every team in the league is calling the, the commissioner's office at this time. Doesn't it? Well, I mean, to, to backtrack and go back to what you're saying about is this, is this a surprise to New York Red Bulls, I absolutely don't think it's a surprise to New York Red Bulls. The New York Red Bulls knew when they bought uh, that team, supposedly, that they had the ability to buy the rights to the second New York franchise to make sure that another franchise didn't come in. At the beginning of all of this, it was in the initial plan back to the conception of this league to have two New York clubs. And I believe that the Metro Stars had the rights to the other New York club to make sure that they had a chance to build their club without having to compete for fans in their own area. And the New York Red Bulls passed up on that opportunity. Now, I've read that. I don't know if that's fact, but I think the New York Red Bulls like this. I think the organization likes that competition. And as far as being down the pecking order, you know, it's still right outside of Manhattan. It's still a Red Bulls organization that has tons of money that they can pump in to build this thing. I think if anything, they welcome the rivalry. They welcome the challenge. And I don't think they're going to fall any further behind any pecking order now that there's another New York team. Because I think Don Garber knows that he can't afford to let this, the, the same thing happen that's happening in L.A., which is to have a super club next to a club that uh, is on life support. Let me ask you about Red Bull Arena. Um, one of the things that has stuck with me, as you pointed out earlier, with the attendance of Red Bull Arena being not ideal, and I, I, I remember at a, at, a, at a match at some point, somebody saying uh, the, to something to the effect of Red Bull Arena wasn't built for 2013. It's built for X amount of years down the road when 25,000 seat arenas are, are needed. If that's the case, it, does this go back to your fan activation argument that, OK, if it's not built for today and now we've got a, a New York City FC in our backyard, um, that would be, be an alarm bell for me as somebody who wants to see packed arenas and doesn't see Red Bull Arena filled now when they're the only game in town. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, when they built that beautiful stadium um, in Harrison, they didn't think from day one it was going to be packed to the rafters and that uh, that area was going to be built up. It was a long-term project. If you look around that area, it still has a long way to go. And I think another team there definitely uh, raises the stakes a little bit. And, you know, here's the thing. The big thing is if MLS is to survive, if MLS is to be sitting at the head table with all the other sports, you need two clubs in Manhattan eventually. That was always going to be a part of the plan. Now, what happened right now is a perfect storm timing-wise of the investors are there. Almost half a billion dollars between Manchester City and the New York Yankees is getting pumped initially back into this league. And you have Mayor Bloomberg, who wanted this as sort of a legacy project after he left. That political help from Mayor Bloomberg and the infusion of money from these huge investors, if it was missed through this window and they didn't capitalize on it, it could have been another 20, 30, 40, 50 years before a perfect storm like that showed up again where they could have pulled the trigger on this. Before we move on to the impact on the rest of the league, does does Thierry Henry ever play New York City FC? Does he ever play for them? No, play against them. Um, whew, that's a tough question. I would say, what are they saying? They're saying 2015. 2015. So, so two more seasons? Yep. Yes. He does. I think he does. I, I think that's his, that's his farewell uh, farewell. Um, season is to be the the first captain of a New York winning MLS franchise against a, another New York team that's in there. I mean, that's just that storybook. And 
based on the way he's playing right now, yeah. I think he can still do it. And you've talked to him many times. Speculate, and I know because I know you haven't asked him this question. If there, when he was thinking about coming over, if there was a team in New York City, would he have been more apt to go and play for that team? Which I guess leads to the bigger issue of moving forward and DPs who are eyeing MLS and what they would do now that they have a choice between a team in New York proper and a team just outside of New York. I mean, it's the same thing. Whether you're playing for New York Red Bulls or you're playing for a New York City FC, he's, he's still living in Soho, uh, having the time of his life. So the, the cachet of being... Uh, of living in New York City exists whichever team you play for. And, and, you know, it remains to be seen whether or not the global brand of New York City FC is going to be uh, more fabulous and, and uh, be more of a draw for these European guys that are coming over here. At the end of the day, success will make one of these teams the Yankees and the other the Mets. You know what I mean? It's going to take a trophy. It's going to take success on the field to really solidify whatever brand either of these teams are going for, because at the moment there, there currently is no successful New York soccer team. I think, and here's where I'm going to slightly disagree with you. Global branding is fine, but I think at the end of the day, and if I'm a New York Red Bull fan, this is kind of what I'm taking heart in. They've had no problem splashing out as much money as needed, and we're in a, we're still in a salary cap situation as far as MLS is concerned, and I say still uh, with the, the kind of the, the nervousness that maybe something that the, the new franchise and the new investors will push for is, a, is an abolition of the, of the salary cap. But as long as there's a salary cap in play, Red Bull, the corporation, will spend the money needed to compete with New York City FC to which it comes, okay, well, who's going to pay me more? And if it's New York Red Bulls, I don't really care what the global brand of New York City FC is at that point in time if, if I'm a big name player. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't saying, I was saying that I, I don't think, I don't think either of these teams is going to have more New York City bright lights, my name in neon cachet to it. But because, I mean, at the end of the day, players who are looking over here who are at the end of their careers are thinking, I want to live in L.A. or I want to live in New York. And they can. And they're going to be able to live in New York, whichever team they play for. At the end of the day, the, the long-term effect of which team is going to be thought of as the big New York City Yankees is yeah. going to come down to whichever team becomes successful first. So let's talk about the league impact. And uh, the thing that I thought about first was the the owners of the other teams throughout MLS and the risk versus the reward. Obviously, a huge cash infusion from the expansion fee will be coming to all of the all of the owners throughout the league. But do they realize or do they have a full comprehension of now the risk involved of, okay, are we going to have to step up or we are going to have to step up our game in whatever we're doing in whatever town we're in to compete with the money that is coming in with New York City FC? Well, I mean, here's the thing. The, there's, it's, it's still single entity, right? I mean, everyone's sort of calling it single entity plus one and laughing at the fact that there are, there are these billion-dollar investors coming in. I mean, there, there are billionaires that are owners of other teams as well. The single entity model trying to force MLS to not go down that historical past that caused soccer to fail here in the past um, still exists, even if there are the Beckham rule little tweaks that you can make. Now, every team, whether you're Columbus crew or your New York City FC, can buy three developmental players and spend what they want on them. So. Yes, will people have to compete with these guys to bring in big name players? Of course, but they're, it's going to end up being the natural selection that happens in professional athletics, where some teams aren't willing to spend that money and are more blue collar, and some teams are. And I think that natural uh, process is important because you know the Houston Dynamo doesn't do DPs and is fine with it and goes to MLS Cups. You know, so obviously buying free DPs um, doesn't translate into success in this league but when you're in a big market like la like new york and you want to compete against other huge teams in that market of course you're gonna have to splash the money out and uh you know i think that's great that 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 owners are going to feel the pressure to have to do that does this accelerate at all the the single entity or the the extinction of the single entity and maybe the salary cap because back in the day when it was los angeles galaxy with money and then new york red bull having money 
those two, the rest of the league kind of could say, no, 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 we need to keep this down, we need to keep this down. But now with TFC, now with Montreal, now with Seattle, now with two New York franchises, now with LA, the, the, the haves are becoming more prevalent, and I would guess their voices are becoming louder. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, um, you know, I think Don Garber has done a good job of quieting the owners down who want to spend more while at the same time uh, quieting the owners down that say they don't want to spend any because there's still there's still a mix. There's still yeah. owners that want to splash and spend more than they're spending, and there's owners that want to spend less than what they're spending. And uh, I think if this league is to be successful, done in a responsible way, and taking a little bit of risk along the way, you need to start having more owners that are willing to splash the money and uh, you know slowly tiptoe away from this single entity idea once you feel like MLS has uh, you know, its claws into the American soccer culture and it's not in jeopardy of uh, collapsing under its own, uh, its, its own spending. I read an article from Jason Davis on ESPN FC about this and how it plays into Don's legacy. And basically it, this, this step in this direction is Don's legacy. Do you, where, how much do you buy into that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that if you took a survey and, and, you know, much like a president, there was there was sort of approval ratings. I think Don's rating would be really high. You know, he's done something extremely difficult to have to to break into the American sports market with the history and the stronghold that these sports have um, is, is an enormous undertaking. And he's caught up with, if not leapfrogged, a couple of major sports in this country. And, uh, you know, I think his last legacy is to eventually take the training wheels off and let this thing run like other leagues are running and see what it can do. You know, I think the last thing, which is sort of ironic because uh, it's, it's my world, is, you know, the TV ratings need to yeah. eventually get to the point where you can justify a lot of these big uh, investments. You know, a lot of people say you got to spend money to make money. I believe that's true in a large respect. But, you know, where is the balance on if you build it, the ratings will come, you know? And so I think Don has been really smart about slowly building the product, getting the quality of soccer better year after year without going and buying the next big things around the world. And uh, now that the, the infrastructure is there, the stadiums are there, and he's done a lot to uh, build the strength of the league to be able to handle uh, the investments they're getting ready to make, it's getting close to that time where you need to start to compete for some of these uh, players that are going to the leagues that are comparable to, uh, to MLS. What does New York City FC coming into the league mean for future expansion? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it'll be difficult to use that as a precedent, whether it be money, stadium, or investors. But uh, I think, if anything, it's going to perk up the ears and the wallets of uh, – of other guys in the uh, in the investment uh, arena, in the in the sports arena, there are going to be these groups that have money that uh, want to diversify their portfolio and look at MLS as a very viable option. I mean, these are the Yankees and Manchester City um, are two groups with a lot of uh, a lot of money in Manchester City and a lot of prestige in the New York Yankees, and they don't just throw money at things. I mean, this is. Uh, this is the combination of a lot of money you can throw and a lot of the years of experience in our market that did their due diligence to make sure that this was an investment they could see a return on. So tell me if I'm wrong in how I'm reading your comments. That doesn't bode well for groups like Orlando or San Antonio who may have passionate fan bases and uh, owners who want to get into the league for the, 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 the atmosphere of the league, but maybe not have the, the dollars that you would see from other large investment groups from cities that may not have as passionate a fan base but have more money, it's going to be a little difficult, more difficult for those, those teams to get in the league if it wasn't already. Well, no, I think this move to put New York in means that sort of one big dog goes in and two little dogs can come in next. You know, I think this was just something where no other – no other city was competing against New York. Yeah. This was something they wanted to do. They weren't looking at bids side by side. The natural markets that aren't big spending markets that have huge fan bases, look at the Portland Timbers, yep. look at uh, uh, Sporting Kansas City, those are essential to Major League Soccer. And you won't have to spend as much money there. You won't have to 
uh, come up with the sort of high-profile investors. You will just have to prove that you have the land, you can build the stadium, and you've got the, uh, the demand for the game. And uh, I think Don putting New York in place right now actually gives those teams a better chance because he doesn't want to follow us up with another huge city uh, um, expansion that doesn't, uh, doesn't have the fan base or the history to warrant it. Let's move on. Um, you, you're in L.A., so you're seeing firsthand what's going on with the Chivas USA situation. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you can see, you, well, you can hear it in, in Chalice's comments that, that the rug has kind of been pulled out from under him, which is weird because we thought going in that he was going in with his eyes open and maybe had some sort of thing going on behind the scenes, and it turns out he was just as surprised about the Aguadella deal as anybody else was, and it seems as if, judging by his comments, he was just as crushed as, as everybody else going, oh, really? You're going to do that now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we need to give uh, him more credit than he deserves. He is a smart, very savvy guy. I don't think he's throwing uh, these quotes off the top of his head. He's very smart about how he positions the media, how he, uh, how he comes across the media, how he protects his player. I mean, he's been full entertainment. I think the, the bigger from 30,000-foot picture of this thing um, which is the perfect segue because we just talked about you know New York, New York, and a lot of people are trying to compare it to L.A., L.A. But this this thing, its wings were clipped before it even got in the air. I mean, the fact that this whole foundation of a second L.A. franchise was built on the branding of the team based on trying to attract a demographic that three fourths of which loathe that brand was just a terrible idea to begin with. And, uh, you know, I think that what's going on there is just, you know, build it up, burn it down, build it up, burn it down, it continuously uh, showing that this thing is getting worse before it gets better and someone needs to step in and do something or else there's going to be 50 people at, that, at those games and you're going to have a coach uh, that's getting more media attention than any player ever has for their club. How can you explain the Aguadelo deal, though? I mean, the Aguadelo deal, for, I mean, for me, if, he's, if he really didn't know what's going on, it doesn't make any sense. But if you watch their moves in the offseason, they were getting rid of players for candy bars. I mean, they, yes. they, they were making the most ridiculous trades I think I've ever seen in the history of this league. So it's consistent with the way they've been managing things from the start. Um, but there's no way to, I mean... Of course, behind the scenes in the in the locker room, it could be a different story. Maybe he didn't like Aguadello. If you if you go based off of his preseason comments, Aguadello took a couple of preseason games off, and uh, and Jelly said that uh, the American training staffs aren't like they are in Mexico, and said that Aguadello should be playing and he's resting and he's not hurt. I mean that that sort of uh, break in the relationship could have happened early, and uh, maybe. He just didn't didn't think he could build a team of uh, of guys that are willing to roll their sleeves up and do whatever they can for each other when you've got guys like Aguadell out there. I mean, that's re trying to read in between the lines yeah. because that's a talented player. I mean, he's he's definitely derailed a little bit and is not on the path he was when he first came into the league. But the upside, if you can get Aguadell at his best, is tremendous. Maybe he just wasn't willing to take the time to uh, let that upside materialize. Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you about. Um, NBC Sports Network. We had Arlo White on uh, a few weeks ago, and you know, I don't want to put you guys in, in awkward spots. I didn't want to deal with Arlo. I don't want to deal with you. But a, a concern of mine as an MLS fan is how MLS will shake out in an NBC Sports Network world where the British Premier League, rightly so, is is the center stage, is is the ratings, is is the money. Um, what have you heard? inside that you can say to us that maybe could alleviate our fears of maybe get, of MLS being set to the side now that you guys are going to be covering the uh, Premier League? Well, I, I can tell you this. This is the, 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 the first answer I could give that can give you an idea of how they're going to treat MLS moving forward is the second though that was announced that, that uh, NBC had acquired the EPL rights, the, the first thing everyone at NBC did, and this is, this is from the higher-ups all the way down to the producer who's on the game with us every weekend, said, MLS is our priority. Um, let's, let's not talk about EPL. Let's not worry about all of this, all of the decisions that need to be made and everything that's going on, because um, MLS is, is very much 
a part of this family and we need to concentrate and continue to produce the broadcast we've been producing. Now, once we've gotten closer to the announcements of EPL, the, a lot of the strategy meetings and a lot of the decisions moving forward always have MLS in the discussion. They're not mutually exclusive. It's always about how to, how to let MLS piggyback the strength and the, the exposure of a property like EPL and, and build MLS up with um, tr- letting it coexist with EPL. It's not about how do we uh, poach certain things from MLS to give to EPL or how do we lessen some of the things we're doing on MLS so that we can strengthen EPL. Uh, I mean, there, is, there are resources, there is money, there is talent. Um, in abundance at NBC, and they're doing whatever they can to position soccer. I mean, th- that that is the 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 silo that gets concentrated on soccer. It's not all of these compartments that are yeah. different brands of soccer. They concentrate just as much on Olympics as MLS, as EPL. All of the meetings will feel the same. All the meetings will sound the same. And in every single meeting, they will talk about how they can strengthen soccer, not just EPL or not just MLS. Great day to have you on, Cobb Martino. I hope the next time we talk, we can actually talk about the on-field product. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be fantastic. (laughs) Kyle Martino, NBC Sports Network. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Great day to have Kyle Martino on. Actually, perfect day to have Kyle Martino on. Nice work from Kyle Sheldon behind the scenes making that happen. I want to give some shout-outs to the producers of the show. As we move from analyst to player, arguably one of the hotter players in the league. You could make a case between him and maybe Jack McInerney. Columbus crew forward Dominic Odoro joins Pitch Pass right now. Dominic, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, well, we, you know what? We just had Kyle Martino on, a uh, former Columbus crew member, now analyst for NBC Sports Network, and we did a lot of talking about uh, New York City FC. We just heard the announcement today as we record. I-, I would actually like to get your thoughts as a player in the league on the announcement of, of another team in New York City. What, what were your initial thoughts? I mean, I mean, everybody's pretty much excited about it. I mean, for the fact that um, the New York Yankees and then um, Man City, um, you know, also like in collaboration with this, I mean, th- 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 this is really huge. Um, not only are we going to have probably players from Europe or high caliber players come in and play, um, we have another team in New York, and I, I believe it's probably going to be somewhere in Queens if, um, if my sources are right. Um, you know, it's really going to be really exciting, you know, just have another team in New York um, to make it a 20th team, you know, everything will be perfect, I guess, you know, with the numbers. Um, it's really exciting. Um, you all just can't wait. Um, hopefully, you know, this new team will, will, will bring the MLS spotlight out. Then, uh, like I said, hopefully uh, we'll again be around, you know, as one of the best um, leagues in, in, in the world. Is, and is that the kind of things that you guys talk about in the locker room when you hear an announcement like that is what it kind of means as far as raising the reputation of the league and, and you guys in the league? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, today there was a little bit buzz about it, but at the end of the day, from a business point of view, you also got to look at it. Um, we're talking about the Yankees and Man City. Yeah. I mean, th- these guys are really highly classified as businesses, so... Um, you can't ignore the marketing part of this strategy at the end of the day. But um, like I said, we are very excited. Uh, you know, this league added another team to MLS. Uh, we, we're not only looking to put MLS on the map, but also to advertise it, you know, outside. And um, I think this is one wonderful good marketing strategy. So You've got to give me the scoop on Papa John's and how <laughs> every, <laughs> everywhere I go and I'm looking up stuff for Dominic Adoro and all I'm seeing is Dominic Adoro and then Papa John's and then Dominic Adoro and Papa John's. Well, what's up with what's up with your thing with Papa John's? Look, I love Papa John's. Man. <laughs> like, I, 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 I mean, I, I used to play for Chicago, so I lived in Chicago. I tried, and Chicago have probably one of the best pizza, you know, in the states. I tried um, Gino's, Giordano's, but I mean, I, I fell in love with Papa John's when I came to the state. Um, I remember I went to the cafeteria one time and, and I had pizza. And then later on, I, I went to buy a Papa John's and that was it. I've never had any other pizza but <laughs> Papa John's pizza. So um, it, it, don't, don't try to even change my mind to eat any other pizza. I wouldn't do it. If it's not Papa John's, I'm not eating it. Oh, no, I'm not going to try to change your mind because I, I'm a big fan. First of all, I like Papa John's. Um, I love the garlic dipping sauce on the side. That That's just well, like... come to the club. Oh. It is amazing. It, now, do you do do you do every 
bite into the garlic sauce, or do you do you eat all the pizza and then the crust goes into the garlic sauce? I I I just like my double cheese. That is it. Um, <laughs> I I I normally even dip um, the the garlic sauce when I'm having um, some of the breadsticks. Yeah. Or you know garlic bread or whatever you want to call it. That is the only time I use um, I use the garlic sauce, but. Uh, I, I, I'm more like double cheese, you know, sometimes a little bit of sausage, but like I said, more like double cheese. I just love it. I just, the smell of it just, <laughs> I get satisfied when I just smell it. I mean, some of the guys, even at local, are even trying to like have this competition where they will blindfold me and I'll eat a bunch of pizzas and I have to like really be 10 more times Papa John's. And I'm like, you guys bring it. The smell of it alone is just, I don't even have to eat it. I just have to sniff it and I'll know, you know, which one is stop and done. I didn't know I could see somebody's eyes light up through the phone line, but I just saw your eyes light up when I mentioned Papa John's. It is incredible. I have Papa John's stuck in my fridge like I, I'm through my the manufacturer of Papa John's or something like that. I think I really need to see the owner. We, we need to cut a deal. Well, have you have you have you parlayed this into some sort of endorsement? You're like Kai Kamara and Chipotle. You could be the Kai <laughs> the, the Kai Kamara of Papa John's. Yeah, uh, we have a deal. I have a deal with Papa John's right now. Um, you know, we put in something that works. Um, it's probably gonna come up in a couple of um, weeks. So uh, it's really I'm really excited about it. Um, like I said, um, probably in, in, in the next two weeks or so, you guys will be seeing something uh, <laughs> with Papa John's. And I'm really excited. What does this say about pizza in Ghana, though? Well, I mean, when I was growing up, we didn't have anything like pizza. Um, I mean, going home recently, I, I have seen a couple of pizza joints, which is not the same. I tried and it, it wasn't even close to Papa John's, obviously. Yeah. So maybe maybe this is uh, me knocking on Papa John's door to open a pizza joint in Ghana. That would be amazing. I wouldn't mind advertising that. But uh, I mean, growing up, I, I, again, you know, I wasn't that fortunate to have pizza, one of my food. But, um, you know, it, it's all part of life process. It ended up, you know, me being here, me coming to love yeah. um, Papa John. So. Of course, of uh, course. Yeah. I, the, the reason yeah. I ask is because when you came over here, I thought maybe you the first bite of pizza you had, no matter where it was from, was going to be the best pizza for the rest of your life. And it just happened to be Papa John's. It did. Uh, like I said, uh, and, and, and honestly, I'm trying to think about or scratch my head on who took me over there. I don't know, but um, if I really, really, if it clicks me and I find a person who really took me there, I think I'm just going to give that person, yeah. you know, a couple of a couple of a gift card or something like that just, just for introducing me to, to that great uh, pizza. They had no idea what they were doing. They changed your life with that. It it did. Um, it did. I mean, I, I literally could eat Papa John's pregame <laughs> meal. I mean, uh, even everybody in the locker room knows that. I just, after every game, I just can't wait to go out there and just have one and, and just enjoy my day. Now, I know you did some time in Richmond. Um, where, where, if you could recommend places to hang out in Richmond, just just to chill and have a good time, uh, where would you recommend in Richmond? Uh, I mean, you can't go wrong well, on Kerry Street. Uh, it has, like, all the restaurants or, you know, over there. I mean, it's like a, a long street with everything that you want. You want to have, um, you know, cheesesteak, whatever. I mean, Kerry Street, um, that, that was the only joint that I... You know, I kind of hang around over there. I mean, I, I wasn't really that much of an out in person. You know, mind you, that was that was my first yeah. time being in the state, so I wasn't really an outgoing person. I didn't even have that means of you know going out. I was a little bit shy when I came at first. I would admit, but uh, Terry Street was a street that uh, we all used to like hang around and, and try to go have fun. Do you think that it helped you? when you first came over to go to a, a mid-sized town like Richmond rather than, say, right to Chicago or right to Houston or right to Dallas? Well, I mean, look, I, I, I count my blessing for, for, for you know, going to Richmond, uh, regardless of um, the fact that whether it changed my life or it didn't change my life. At the end of the day, I did learn a whole lot of stuff, uh, which is helping me right now, you know, to live as an adult. So, um uh, whatever be the case, I, I think it's a blessing. Whatever I learned or I didn't learn, at the end of the day, I think I, I have experienced a whole lot of stuff, you know, living in Virginia, going to school in Virginia. So um, I wouldn't take anything back. You know, life is always full of surprises. And uh, uh, like I said, I, I'm very grateful for even my coach, Tim O'Sullivan, for bringing me here to the States. And, um, you know, my life right now, I'm very grateful.
I know that Adam Jardy of the Columbus Dispatch asked you maybe six weeks ago about 40 times as we were getting ready for the NFL uh, draft in the combine. <laughs> and you had said you had never run a 40 before, which makes sense because wh- why in the world of soccer, especially world soccer, would you ever decide, oh, 40 yards is the measurement of my speed? But what did you say that you, you would run if you were ever timed? Well, like I said, uh, I remember when I was in Dallas when I got drafted, uh, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Michael Johnson. He has uh, this training facility, yeah. um, in, in, I believe it's in Frisco, if I'm not wrong, Plano or Frisco. And, uh, you know, we, 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 he used to have some of his guys to, uh, you know, come train us. We used to go to his facility, you know, to work out a little bit. And I remember we did work on speed and um, we did a little bit of timing on the 40. Uh, and and mind you, this is you should you know our training is different from how those NFL yeah. guys you know train. Um, they do speed work and stuff. So we we kind of like uh, did a little bit of that. And I think I hit um four point three, I believe. Uh, okay. And I was I was even told if I really you know work hard on my agility and stuff, I'll be able to. I don't know. I, I'm not saying I'll probably go down, but I will still be able to. Yeah. Maybe maintain that form. And um. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about. It. I don't think I've lost my speed. I still say I'm still the fastest guy in MLS. Um, it's verified. It's certified. I don't care who else thinks, you know, he's faster than me. That is not going to happen. Um, and I believe if I train hard, you know, for that kind of um, yeah exercise that our MLS um, NFL guys do, who knows? Maybe I'll be able to give them competition. So what you're saying is you were just working out with Michael Johnson. Somebody asked you, hey, what's your 40 time? And you were like, I don't know. And then you just got out there and ran a 40. You didn't do two, three months of training specifically to run a 40. And you dropped the 4-3 on him just, just, just messing around. Yeah. I mean, we, we, did, a, we did a couple of training stuff, yeah. um, you know, speed work, but it wasn't exactly what those NFL guys did. And uh, they, we did, I, I think everybody on the team did a 40-yard dash. And that is when I clocked um, that time. And again, you know, I was told at that time, trust me, my my body um, movement and the way I run was so bad, you know. And, and and I remember that guy was like, look, if you work on your shape, the way you yeah. run. Because, you know, there's all this technique with your arms and stuff like that, that, that you, when you adjust, it, it kind of like really helps you like microseconds, which, you know, when running, you need that, you know, to cover a lot of grounds. So um, he said, if you work on that, um, you should be able to do good. And I have been working on that. I, I believe my running has changed um, when I started this league. And it, it's been fantastic. You know, I've been able to bypass defenders, you know, with a little bit of kick off my leg and stuff like that. And with the way I move my arms, and it's been working. So I don't see any reason why I should stop. Um, I'm just trying to improve on it. And hopefully I'll still maintain being the fastest guy in MLS. Is there is there something in Ghana where they measure speed or is it it is it not is it not something where they 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 care and i kind of feel like this way about the rest of the world what what unit of 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 space does it matter how fast you are and does it matter in ghana or is it just are you fast or are you not fast well listen let me tell you this i know there are a bunch of guys in ghana who are really faster than me i can guarantee you that um i i there used to be some fast pretty fast guys out there but um, mind you, those guys weren't playing soccer, you know, at the end yeah. of the day. So, like I said, um, their training was different. And even there were some guys who were playing soccer, too, who were really faster than me. Uh, you know, Ghana is a, it's, it's a third world country. You know, we're developing right now. But um, when I was growing up, there wasn't anything about trying to even run a 40 at that. Yeah. I, I even planned out about running for a 40 when I came to the United States. We don't have anything like running a 40 back home. Um we just go out there, we just train, you know, we play on the street. Um, you know, I have a whole lot of scars in front of my legs and we just start playing on the street, stuff like that. So we just go out there and have fun. Uh, but it wasn't anything like that. Uh, I, trust me, if, if, if there was at that time or if there is right now, uh, then I can guarantee you some guys in Ghana really running faster than you can even think right now. All right, well, let me ask you this, uh, and I'll give you the crown. Uh, a fastest guy in MLS. If you tell me who's who's clipping at your heels, who's what? Who's clipping at your heels? What what M- what player in MLS do you think to yourself? Uh, all right, if I'm the fastest, that guy's the second fastest. I mean, I I, I won't disrespect uh, you know Marvin Wayne. Um, I think mm-hmm. he's out there. Um, you know, I'll give him that. I'll give um, Chavez um, from. Um, San Jose, you mm-hmm. know, a little bit of edge too. Um, I think London Donovan is really quick. I don't think he's fast, but uh, I know I know he has a little bit of momentum when, when he gets going. Um, 
you know, all those guys, I'll, I'll probably put it out there, but, uh, you know, they can't take it away from me. So. <laughs> and do you look at it like, I know personally or professionally as a team, you, you want to win every match, but when you see Colorado uh, coming up on the schedule, do you think to yourself, because a lot of the, a lot of the guys who are, who are considered fast or the fastest guys in the league are, are forwards like yourself. Whereas Marvell yeah. Wynn, as you mentioned, is, is a center back. Do you think to yourself, all right, I got to make sure I, I got my, my fast, my speed boots on today because I'm going up against a guy that, that if, if I'm off by a step, this guy will be on me. Well, I mean, at the, end of, at the back of my mind, I know he has good recovery. Yeah. But I also know um, if I'm able to get that microsecond away from him, I mean, there's no way he's catching me. Like I said, uh, that makes a whole lot of difference. Just one one gallop or one, you know, one or two couple of yards, you know, you just away from the defender. I mean, if he clips you, hopefully that's a PK. If not, you know, you do. So um, it's there, you know, you know, he has good recovery. You just try as much as possible to make that run, you know, that that time and run whereby you just have that edge of a second, you know, ahead of him and then, you know, you, you just try 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 and cut the ball in the net. So um at the back of your mind, you know, you know he's there, you know he can catch up to you, but I mean, you don't make that a priority. You just try and focus on the game and um you know, try to win stuff games like that. I know you have uh one cap for Ghana. Is it how how much in your mind is it to to continue to play well to to represent your country again? Okay, again, um, you know, I was blessed to to play for my national team. Um, I'm still I'm still keeping my heads up. I'm trying to play well. I'm trying to work hard. You know, maybe to get another call. That was a dream come true for me. And um, yeah, I, I still have to maintain that form. I think I'm having also a great season right now. Hopefully, um, the FA is still is, is looking around and hopefully they they they're looking at my performance and yeah. seeing that I'm doing all the right things to maybe give me another call but I mean it has to start for me like you said <laughs> I have to at the end of the day play well you know try as much as possible to score as many goals as I can make it hard for them not to ignore me and um, uh, once I do that I, I believe maybe I'll get a call but it has to start for me too I have to do all the right things you had eleven. You had twelve goals in in twenty eleven for Chicago Fire. That's in thirty three matches. You've already got five this year in eleven. What's what's clicking for you this year? Um, my teammates. Uh, you know, I have I have a great locker room, and uh, we play for each other. You know, and I have guys who are serving me balls. You know, I I I can I, I have to talk about Iguain a little bit. Yeah. I mean, look at my my current goal. He just gave me like probably the best ball um, seven that, I, that I've had in a couple of years. And, um, you know, you, you can't ignore guys like that. So um, I'm making the rounds, but I have my teammates who are, you know, giving me the balls at the right place at the right time. And um, I'm also making good runs, you know, into the box, which is helping me. But, I mean, I, I can't take credit for all that. I have to, I have to credit um, my teammates and my coaches for, for p- putting me out there, for believing in me, and, um, you know, trying as much as possible to give me that much confidence to go out there and play. You mentioned Higuain. Did you guys feel like you had a, a, a good understanding of each other from the first time you were on the pitch together, or did, was this something where he needed to figure out where you really liked balls? Well, I mean, it was bumpy a little bit when I, when I came to um, when I came to Columbus. Uh, you know, we knew that, but uh, we, we we talk a lot. You know, on the field, off the field, and and, and like I said, as you see, it's been it's been working pretty much lately. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to work every other game on the field, but, I mean, that is the plan. At the end of the day, we try to execute that. But, um, you know, he's the kind of guy that he always, he, at, at the end of practice, he pulls me outside, he talks to me. You know, sometimes when we just have him fun, he's always saying, when I get the ball, when I get my head up, you know, I'm going to look at you first, so you just make that run and I'll find you. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we know defenders, are, you know, sometimes they read that, but um, look, at the end of the day, like I said, out of like maybe five or six balls, you will find that one time when you penetrate through that defense, and uh, that is all that as a forward you look for, that one chance to put the ball in the net. So, uh, we, um, we're going to keep doing that. Um, people know it's coming, but still, we still got to, you know, still keep beating that drum, and hopefully, uh, you know, we get a fine team. It'll be very hard for you to maintain the strike rate that you have going on right now in this season. But I would assume that there you do want to maintain some level of consistency uh, in your strike rate or in your overall play. Is there anything you think you need to do to maintain this type of consistency throughout not just the rest of the season, but as you move forward as a player? 
Well, I mean, I, I believe every player, you know, has room for improvement. I mean, no matter how good you are, you, you, that is why you practice every day. Otherwise, I'll probably sit at home and just eat Papa John's and go play every weekend. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, listen, at the end of the day, I have to stay focused. Um, that is one thing. Okay. I really have to stay focused. Uh, I got to take care of myself, my body, um, mentally, physically. And also, I think I have to have that motivation, you know, for my teammates and for my coaches. Uh, without motivation, I mean, you nobody. If 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 the coach start believing in you, if your team is start believing in you, um, you know your head goes down, and I don't want that to happen. Um, it, 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 like you said, it, it's not that easy, you know, to maintain that um, plateau off level. But at the end of the day, you know, once you keep doing all the, all the right stuff, like I said, you know, staying focused, you know, your team is helping you out. Um, I think you should be fine. Or well, it will be bumpy down the road, but you know, once you stick together, right. You can achieve it. So um, I have my teammates behind me. I have my coaches behind me. Um, so uh, you're gonna make something happen. Where were you when the uh, scoreboard fire happened? When what? When the scoreboard fire at Crew Stadium happened? Um, I remember we were warming up. Uh, I believe it was like probably ten minutes before kickoff. You know, we we're doing our usual warm up, and I just saw people like staring. At the scoreboard, I didn't even know what was happening. Obviously, when people keep staring at one place, you have to also, yeah. you know, look at it. And you know, we just saw the scoreboard burning, and we were like, Uh-oh. "Oh, holy cow, <laughs> what's going on over here?" So, um, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it, it was just fun. It was entertaining. Yeah, you know, as, as bad as it, it was, but um, you know, the firefighters came and people were just clapping. And I remember during um, the national anthem. Everybody was singing the national anthem, uh, which was, you know, I mean, you have a goosebump if you're yeah. there, you know, for everybody to just start singing right after that because we knew the public address system, I think, was messed up. So um, at the end of the day, it, it was an unfortunate thing that happened, but it ended up um, giving us, you know, the edge and, and 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 the motivation to go out there and play. And I believe we won that game 3 0. So, did you? Really uh, yes, you did win it over uh, over my team, DC United Dominic. So, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic Adoro, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for giving us some time. All right, man. You're welcome. Uh, have a good one. For more show information, go to pitchpass.com.